Thank you very much for um, inviting me and, and having me. And, um, and thank you for, uh, for uh, coming today. I, I know some of you are based in the UK and it's, uh, it's an unusual day with more than 30 degrees. So uh, the outside, there was an outside option. So uh, thanks for, uh, for making it. Uh, so first of all, this is a joint work with Daria and Alastair. Uh, Daria is a, a second year, finishing her second year uh, of the PhD here in Cambridge. Alastair is starting um, uh, his, his PhD uh, this year. Um, okay, so I don't need to really tell, uh, tell you that uh, COVID-19 has been uh, a big shock and uh, it's something that uh, uh, we haven't seen in, in uh, decades, a shock of this um, magnitude. Now, the, the focus of, um, uh, there's a lot of things that came with COVID-19, but the focus for today is really on a, on a measure that um, uh, governments worldwide have adopted, one of the most widespread measures to actually slow the spread uh, of COVID-19, and that is uh, social distancing. Right? So here it's a, a WHO document that is just as one example of uh, highlighting the importance of social distancing to um, both uh, stop the spread of the disease at the height of the contagion, uh, but also, most importantly, um, we know that, uh, unfortunately, from estimates that experts uh, give us, the time frame, uh, you know, even in the most optimistic scenarios, the time frame for having a vaccine that is widely available uh, globally is, and this is a science uh, article that estimates about 18, 24 months. This was published like three, four months ago. Um, there is um, really a race to produce a vaccine at a, at a, at a a pace that is unprecedented, but even with that, the global availability is going to be at least one year away. And, uh, and that means that social distancing is here to stay for uh, the medium term. And um, uh, what has happened is that uh, this deployment of social distancing measures um, in really the large majority of countries worldwide is um, unprecedented. Uh, this is a policy that uh, is quite new. Uh, we have not, uh, obviously, it's been applied locally in, uh, in previous more local outbreaks, uh, but uh, at this global level and at, uh, at the level of government applying it um, for a whole country, um, this is quite unprecedented. And the fact that it's unprecedented uh, also means that we don't have enough data to actually um, uh, you know, make an informed choice as governments on what is the best policy to promote social distancing and or what is the best policy to actually enforce uh, these measures that are essential for the containment uh, of the pandemic. And indeed, the fact that there is this lack of information is reflected in um, the variety of policies that have been applied by governments um, across uh, the world uh, to actually uh, enforce uh, and promote social distancing policies that are put in place. Uh, so, for example, there are some countries that um, uh, went quite heavy on the enforcement side of, um, of things. So, for example, uh, in Singapore, uh, uh, there is very strict rules that uh, are uh, enforced very frequently uh, for violators uh, that put really, really heavy financial penalties on uh, people that do not observe uh, physical distancing. Um, and you know the fines go all the way up to seven thousand uh, US dollars, and um, and you know, the, actually the, the threshold to apply the fine, I mean obviously not the highest fine, but the threshold to apply the fine is is, is quite low. Right? Uh, so the approach there is really the fines are um, the best way to enforce it, uh, and this is not uh, an atypical case. Uh, it's been true, um, for example, in Italy. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of um, enforcement through. Uh, fines, uh, smaller magnitude, uh, but uh, it was actually quite widespread and that was the first uh, approach that was tried. So if someone was not respecting uh, the social distancing guidelines, the fine was applied um, straight away and, uh, and that was the first point of the escalation of uh, essentially penalties and, and enforcement uh, measures. A different example where there was uh, a softer approach is, um, for example, the UK. Um, in the UK, the focus has been very much on what we can call informational campaigns, and that's uh, 
as a sort of more catchier and briefer way of conveying it, I'll call it nudge throughout the, um, the talk. And uh, uh, some of you, most of you have actually been in the UK, um, you know about the uh, informational campaign on stay safe first, and now it's stay alert and safe uh, guidelines. These are from the cabinet office. Um, and it was clear that um, when the social distancing guidelines came into place, uh, the way that they would be um, promoted was through uh, encouraging people, through nudges to actually uh, practice uh, social distancing. And uh, there was also a bit of lack of clarity at the beginning and, and even uh, official guidance from uh, the police uh, came out and said that uh, uh, look, social distancing is government guidance. It's not um, uh, something that we can uh, enforce through fines. So, you know, what essentially what they can do is to encourage people to, uh, if they see people not social distancing, to actually uh, social distancing, but there can be an escalation to fines only if they violate, they do something else. For example, they you know, resist force or, or they do something else um, that, uh, that is not social distancing. Uh, and so these are sort of the two examples that are um, at, the, um, at the two ends of the, the ways that uh, social distancing can be promoted uh, and that have been widely applied, fines on one end and um, more informational campaigns uh, on the other. So this raises some questions and these are questions that uh, we need information to be able to uh, answer uh, quickly in order to actually uh, apply a policy that uh, is most effective. And uh, the first question is, you know, are fines uh, effective at promoting social distancing? Are uh, nudges uh, or informational campaigns um, effective at promoting social distancing? And what is the relative effectiveness uh, of these two? Right? You, for example, may think that if they have the same level of effectiveness, then perhaps nudges, informational campaigns, are a softer approach that is preferable to, uh, to fines. Uh, uh, another question that um, uh, we may be interested in is, is uh, how uh, attitudes towards social distancing are going to change uh, depending on uh, whether you know that you are someone that is particularly uh, prone to, for example, spreading the virus because you have a lot of interactions. And uh, we're going to uh, think about both in terms of the absolute number of interactions that you have with others, uh, but it may, you know, it's going to be the same. It's just going to be a group where there are a lot of interactions, as well as relative number of interactions, and, and touch upon the um, the topic of of being a super spreader, uh, so that you are someone that in the group that you are in spreads um, the disease much the disease much more than than others do. And um, an obvious uh, question when it comes to uh, the epidemiology of it is that uh, whether there's more social distancing in a high contagion environment where you would expect that it's, uh, that it's even more uh, important. Um, and finally, we're also going to uh, look at um, associations of the social distancing behavior that we, that we see uh, in terms of the characteristics of the individual. So uh, it, an interesting question is how does social distancing vary? For example, uh, if you are in the case of the US, if you are conservatives or uh, a Democrat. So let me give you a, a preview of our findings before actually getting into the meat of the, uh, of the framework and the design and the results. Uh, so the first message is that uh, fines are going to significantly increase social distancing, uh, while informational campaigns or nudges are going to have uh, a smaller impact, which is about half the size of fines. And um, it's the significance of the impact of nudges is not uh, always there. It's not robust to all the specifications that you can try. While the impact of fines is going to be robust uh, throughout. A second message is that um, uh, super spreaders, which in this case are going to be individuals that interact um, with many others, are more likely to distance than uh, peripheral individuals. I'm aware that I'm using the super spreader terminology in a loose sense, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, but if you are someone that uh, is more likely to spread because you have more interactions than others in the group that you're in, uh, then you're going to distance more. And um, finally, uh, 
one uh, important factor that is associated with, uh, strongly associated with uh, distancing behavior in the case of the US is uh, political ideology. If you're on the progressive end of the spectrum, you do more distancing. If you are conservative leaning, you do less distancing. And this is a, a strong uh, effect. Um, uh, the final um, uh, thing that I want to highlight, at least in this uh, high level preview, is the social preferences matter as well. Right? So if you uh, clearly, people that care about others, as we elicit in a uh, social preference elicitation task, um, are, going to, uh, are going to distance uh, more. And uh, this is also something that uh, comes across as a sizable effect and significant. So the way I'm going to uh, proceed is to tell you uh, briefly about the setup. And um, we do have a, a you know, simple uh, theoretical model that's going to give us um, um, equilibrium predictions if there are self-interested preferences. Um, testing this prediction is not the focus, so I will briefly uh, mention that to point out a few things, but then I want to go into the design of the experiment uh, straight away and um, talk about the effectiveness of the different, um, uh, the different treatments that we look at. So for example, policy, um, you know, position in the network and, um, and contagion. And I'll come back to um, uh, the uh, predictions uh, in the end. So the setup that we look at is um, the following. Um, the participants are going to be assigned to uh, nodes of a network. And a link uh, in this network is going to be undirected. It's going to denote uh, the probability of contagion, which we're going to call uh, P, and it's going to be one of our treatment uh, dimensions. Now, the choice that each individual has to make is whether to practice social distancing at a known cost. And this cost is the same for everybody. The decision to practice social distancing is a private decision the individual uh, takes. And um, uh, everything is, is common knowledge. Uh, participants know that there will be one and only one participant, uh, which is going to be randomly exposed to uh, COVID-19. And um, uh, what happens when that participant I is, going, is randomly exposed is that if uh, that participant is not social distancing, they're going to be infected for sure. Uh, if they are social distancing, they're going to be infected with like a 50% probability. Uh, now, once uh, and if and once uh, a participant is infected, then uh, COVID-19 can spread in the network. Uh, it can spread according to this probability P, which is the same for all interactions uh, in the network and it's known to everybody. Uh, if, a social dis if an individual is social distancing, then they cannot spread um, the COVID-19 and they cannot contract it. So for example, if the participant that is uh, picked to actually be exposed to COVID-19 has chosen to social distance, then there won't be a spread of, of, uh, of COVID-19. And finally, it's going to be a benefit. Uh, if at the end of the contagion process, uh, some people are going to be infected, some people are going to be uh, healthy. Uh, if you are uh, healthy, you get a benefit. Uh, if you are infected, you get zero. Um, and in, we're not going to, the information on the uh, you get information about your outcomes and your payoff, uh, but not on what the other participants have decided or uh, their outcomes. Now, briefly, if we assume that um, uh, all the individuals have um, self-interested preferences, so they only care about their own payoff, and we look at a specific uh, type of uh, calibration, which is going to be the calibration that we're going to use uh, in the experiments, where the benefits are going to be 100 and the cost is going to be 35. Um, this is what happens with um, uh, equilibrium uh, that's in green uh, and with efficiency, uh, when efficiency is, we think about it in terms of uh, utilitarian definition of summing, just summing up uh, payoffs uh, in blue for the two uh, network environments that we um, explore in the experiments, uh, the complete network on the top and the star network uh, at the bottom. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but uh, the main takeaways are that uh, you know, if we compare the numbers, uh, uh, so here what we are bearing is the rate of contagiousness, right? so the P. Uh, so if we compare the green, which are the equilibria to the, to the blues, um, uh, you can see that uh, with self-interested preferences, uh, there is going to be 
a unique equilibrium uh, here, and uh, essentially there's going to be um, uh, under, um, so there's going to be too little social distancing right? uh, in, most, uh, in most parameter uh, configuration, most parameter, in most values of the, of the peak. Especially with, with low contagion, it's going to be um, too little distancing, uh, and there's going to be too little distancing also with, here with high contagion. Situation is a bit more um, complicated with the star network because uh, in some cases, so first of all, when it comes to efficiency, S is going to be the super spreader. So that's just the, the hub of the, of the star. Um, the efficient outcome is always for um, the uh, super spreader, the hub to actually distance. Uh, what happens though is for some, uh, for example, low contagion, there's still going to be um, too little social distancing. Uh, as you move in, in more high contagion environments, in some, um, uh, in some values of the P, there's going to be multiple equilibrium, right? And one equilibrium being uh, the efficient one, where the super spreader is distancing, the other one where the, uh, a number of spokes, the peripheral players, are distancing. Um, so this is, you know, we can have a, a, a complete characterization of the equilibrium, but I'll come back to this only towards the end of the of the talk. So let me go through the design of the experiments. Uh, so we have uh, a baseline, which is going to be 20 rounds of the game that I just showed you. Uh, the group is fixed, uh, and participants are randomly assigned to a node in each round of the game. Right? After these 20 rounds, uh, that's when we have the uh, first, the policy intervention, so the first uh, treatment uh, dimension. And uh, the participants play another 20 rounds under one of two policies. So they are either exposed to the fine or to the nudge. So the fine and nudge is going to be between uh, subjects. Now the fine uh, treatment is that um, in each round, the participant is going to pay a penalty, which is going to be F, uh, whenever they don't practice social distancing. Right? And they always have to pay this fine. Uh, that is the fine uh, intervention. In the nudge, what we call the nudge intervention, uh, is a, a, an informational three-minute video that the participants have to watch uh, at the end of the baseline, so at the end of the first 20 rounds, that explains to them uh, the harm that you do to others if you do not practice social distancing. So that is the informational campaign and intervention, and it happens between round 20 and the first round of the uh, intervention. Um, other than this, the, the 20 rounds under the policy intervention are going to be identical to um, uh, the baseline. So you're going to be in the same group, uh, and you're going to be randomly assigned to a node uh, in each round. Uh, we have quizzes both to assess the understanding of the game at the beginning before you start the baseline, as well as uh, understanding the, uh, the, you know, you know, realize what the fine is and understanding the video. So there's going to be a question that makes sure that they have watched the video and, um, uh, and you know, they have to pass this quiz in order to go to the second phase. We have two other treatment uh, dimensions. The first is um, the network the participants are assigned to. The network stays the same for the 40 rounds. Uh, it's going to be a complete and a star network, but the way I want you to think of it and the way I'm going to present um, you know, the results are in terms of the three different types of positions that there are in these two networks. Right? Now, obviously, a complete network, everybody is, you know, is the same. Uh, I'm going to call this a close-knit uh, position. Close-knit, it's highly connected. Uh, you're connected to everybody, uh, but also everybody is highly connected like you are. Right? So it's a place where there's a high number of connections, but... Uh, these are uh, homogeneous across uh, everybody in the group. Uh, the star obviously has two types of positions. One is going to be what we're going to call the super spreader. This is highly connected, as highly connected as the close knit, uh, but there is a clear heterogeneity between uh, this individual and the number of connections of the peripheral one, which is going to be the third uh, type of positions. These are poorly connected people that have only one interaction, and that's with the super spreader. Uh, obviously, when we think about comparison, super spreader and peripheral is within treatments, close knit, and the others is going to be between uh, treatments. And the final uh, treatment variation is going to be the um, uh, 
contagiousness of the environment. It's going to be the same throughout the 40 rounds. Uh, and you're either going to be assigned to a, a low contagion condition, that's going to be 15% uh, probability of contagion, uh, or a high contagion condition, which is going to be uh, 65%. In terms of implementation, first of all, uh, we are priming participants to think of this virus, this illness as COVID-19. Right? So we take the official, uh, in this case, US guidelines on the symptoms of uh, uh, COVID-19, and, um, and this is the primary that they get uh, at the beginning of the experiment when we present uh, the disease. Uh, we choose to have groups uh, that are going to be n equal to five. Um, indeed, actually, I should have put that before. The, so what, I, what I showed you before is, is for a, a calibration with n equal to five. Um, this is the calibration parameters that I've already told you about. And uh, other aspects uh, of the implementations are quite standards. Uh, we pay four random neutron round in each part in terms of the incentives. Um, experiments, as you'll see, is, is um, conducted online. It's coded using uh, O3. And uh, we're going to also run uh, two types of the licitation task. Uh, one is uh, the social value orientation to classify subjects according to uh, their social preferences. And the second one is a risk licitation task, uh, which is this uh, BOMB risk licitation task, um, which um, uh, perhaps you're less familiar than, than others, but uh, it's kind of like the, the minefield, the mind game that uh, if you're old enough, you are used to play on, uh, on uh, you know, very old uh, uh, computers. It used to be one of the first uh, computer games. And it's kind of uh, ad you know, adapted to this context to, um, to a list of risk preferences. And personally, I like it. I like it a lot. I think it works better than Holt and Lorian and other standard ones. Um, Okay, so this is uh, a screenshot of the interface. As you can see uh, here, the participants is assigned to the hub. Uh, you can see the structure of the network. Your decisions is whether you practice social distancing or not. Uh, and you're reminded of all the relevant um, uh, parameters. In this case, uh, this is the second round of part two. So you have, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're told about, you know, uh, if you make the decision of social distancing, uh, for example, you're infected, you know, what your payoff uh, is going to be. So you, you, you see all the, all the information there um, as you make uh, your decision. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is uh, the results from the experiments that we did on uh, US participants. These are from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, that is the largest uh, crowdsourcing platform um, uh, worldwide, but especially in the, in the US. Uh, we're going to have 400 participants uh, and... Um, uh, and therefore, there are going to be 10 groups per uh, treatment. We have eight treatments uh, in total. Uh, now, I'm aware that this um, series is called Large Scale Experiments, and I don't know what uh, P400 uh, um, you know, fits the large scale label. So uh, what I can tell you is that we have two other projects, which I already mentioned uh, a moment ago uh, after Sanjeev's question. Uh, one is they're both ongoing, actually, in India and China. Uh, uh, the one in there is a replication of what we are doing in the US, also on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, the India Pudo participant is the second largest on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, the experiments will be over a longer time frame. So one advantage of that is, is to explore changes in social distancing attitudes in different phases of the pandemic. Um, uh, truth be told, I mean, part of the reason why it's a longer time frame is that there are some uh, bigger challenges in terms of getting the required number of participants. So that's, that's, part, of the, that's part of the story. Uh, but it will be you know, one advantage of, of going over a longer, longer time frame. Um, the project in China is almost finished with well, what, two thirds, three fourths of the way. And um, uh, there we only do have the high contagion treatment. So we don't vary the treatments, uh, the contagion in the treatment dimension. Uh, the focus there though is, is different. The focus there is to really see if there's any difference in social distancing attitude between participants from Wuhan, which as you all know, was the epicenter of the pandemic. And uh, you know, there was, but you know, people were locked down for months uh, with very strict uh, uh, rules in place uh, to see if, if that had an impact on um, people's attitudes towards social distancing compared to the rest of China. So we have a representative sample of the rest of China and half of the participants are gonna be from uh, Wuhan. Um, the way the experiment work, uh, this is all conducted online. Uh, we do a recruitment survey uh, in order to get social demographics uh, information. 
Then we create a representative sample of the population. So this is going to be a representative sample of the US population when it comes to age, gender, and geographical location. And actually, you know, if you, if you look at, um, you know, even for age and geographical location, the representation that we get is, is, um, is, is good in terms of uh, uh, the national statistics. The reason why this sample is near representative is that then obviously once they are invited to the experiments, uh, then you know there may be uh, some slight bias in who counts, uh, but uh, uh, you know in, in the end the sample that we get is actually uh, quite representative in terms of age, gender, geographical location. Experiments last about half an hour, um, and it was conducted uh, in May. So this is at the height of the uh, of the pandemic, and the workflow is that they click on a on a link on Amazon Mechanical Turk, they go on um, our platform, uh, they go to a tree. They go through the instructions, the quiz, the experiments, the post-experimental questionnaire, and then they are, uh, they get a payment code and they're paid through Amazon Mechanical Turk. So Amazon Mechanical Turk is essentially just the source of participants and the, and the way that we pay them. And there's of course full anonymity throughout uh, the experiment. Uh, so if there are any questions about the design, this is the moment to ask, otherwise I'm gonna move to the uh, results. So, first of all, let me show you uh, by aggregating everything together uh, what happens in terms of our really main variable that we're looking at, which is the probability of distancing. So, here, uh, what you see is the evolution of distancing in the baseline. We're putting everything together in the baseline because everybody in the baseline, the first 20 rounds, is, is the same. Uh, there's no difference between you know, the baseline in the nut treatment and the baseline in the fine treatment. Um, as you can see, they start quite high and they sort of go down, which is what you would expect typically in. in this kind of experiment, which is similar to, uh, you can think of as a public goods um, game experiments. Uh, so it goes down a bit and then it kind of stabilizes. And I will show you that it stabilizes um, at, um, at this level here between uh, 60 and 70%. Uh, then there's the policy intervention. And uh, what um, uh, you can notice straight away is that we can do a structural break analysis that says there's these 40 rounds, we're agnostic to whether there's any structural break in these 40 rounds, can you find a, a structural a break? And we can always find the structural break when there is the fine and at the exact round in the 21st round. Uh, so there's clear change from uh, going from the baselines to the fine from the application of the fine. Uh, when it comes to the nudge, uh, we can find this some of the time. So if we then break it down by contagion and by network, uh, some of the time, the, we, we cannot find that the structural break is present at uh, around 21, and some of the time we can find it. And this is already indicative of a difference between the, the nudge and the find that we're gonna explore in more detail in a moment, because you can already see straight away that the nudge is always below the find, right? The, the effect in terms of social distance that the find has is, um, uh, you know, higher straight away, and then it stays uh, higher as as you move along the the twenty rounds of the of the second part. Just to show you that the, uh, I won't be uh, focusing that much on the contagion level in the talk because what we get is a strong effect of uh, the contagion uh, treatment. So if you are in the high contagion, your level of distancing is is higher in the baseline and in the uh, in you know in the nudge or the fine. Uh, intervention uh, in the 65% high contagion compared with 15% low contagion, which is exactly what we expect. Um, I won't be focusing that much on this because um, we don't, I mean, the, the, the main findings that we have apply to both contagion settings. And so there's no specific finding that, uh, that I want to highlight that applies to one setting and does not apply to the, to the other setting. That's why you know, the analysis won't look at the two different contagion levels that much until the, the very end when I'll show you that the contagion attack is, is quite high, the treatment uh, itself. Uh, but this is exactly what we expect, and you can see that the trend is similar in both in the low contagion and high contagion uh, treatments. So uh, a couple of words about the analysis, um, it's kind of the methodology we're using uh, throughout. Uh, the first one is that, uh, as you can see uh, here, there is uh, a trend, for sure, in the baseline at the beginning about uh, uh, distancing decisions. And uh, what we're going to do is to look at uh, whether there is convergence in distancing decisions. 
and then look at differences once um, they have converged to a, a certain distancing uh, decision. And the definition of convergence that we're going to use uh, in the experiments uh, with, with experimental data is that um, you, you have converged, think about the complete, right? You have converged if you do the same distance in decision. So for example, if I always distance uh, for three rounds in a row, and after these three rounds, I never deviate from always distancing for more than two consecutive rounds. Right? Um, that's the definition of convergence for the complete. Uh, for the star, it's a bit more complicated because we have to, you know, we also take into account about, you know, more, slightly more complicated strategy, which could be that the, com the strategy that I converge to is that one, when I'm assigned to be a super spreader in the middle of the star, I distance. When I'm assigned to periphery, I don't distance. That can also be a strategy that you converge to. So we take those into account. Once we do that, uh, then more than four thirds of subjects converge after the first 10 rounds in both the baseline and the policy intervention. So that's what we're going to look at uh, in the analysis, the last 10 rounds. Uh, but the, the results I'm going to show you are robust, even if you look at all the 20 rounds. Uh, so all the, all the rounds in, uh, in, the, in the experiment. And the way I'm going to um, uh, present the results is sort of two um, level of analysis. Uh, the first one is uh, non-parametric analysis, where we aggregate at the group level. And so we're going to have uh, um, you know, uh, 10 observations in one specific treatment. And then if we aggregate treatment together, we look at our dimensions, it's going to be 20 or 40 observations. And we're going to look at um, within treatment uh, comparisons. For example, within treatment comparison is going to be the policy uh, uh, that is put in place, right? That's going to be the same treatments. Uh, you're exposed to the baseline and then you're exposed to uh, the, for example, the uh, fine. Uh, and between treatment comparison. Between treatment comparison is going to be, for example, looking at uh, close knit and uh, super spreader, right? So if you're close knit, so in a complete network or super spreader in a star network, that's going to be between treatments. That's going to be uh, Mount Whitney, which is started on, on unmatched uh, data. Always looking at the last 10 rounds. Uh, we're also going to be uh, doing a parametric analysis that's going to look at the last 10 rounds uh, as well. It's going to be a uh, logic model with distancing as our uh, dependent variables. And you're going to see uh, what, um, what we look at, but we're going to look at treatment variables, social demographics, uh, preferences in terms of risk and social preferences, um, ideology, and interaction of ideology with our um, uh, policy uh, treatments. Uh, with standard errors clustered at the group level. The results I'm going to present are going to be sort of results that are robust throughout a lot of different specifications. For example, including all rounds. Uh, you can just run the analysis just looking at low contagion environment and high contagion environments. Uh, you can look at additional type of interactions, um, different specifications, what we mean by ideology. Um, you know, what I'm going to show you that is significant is going to be robust to a lot of these uh, variations. So the first key result is the effectiveness of the fine. It significantly increases distancing compared to the baseline. That's an 8% increase in probability of distancing. And it's highly significant both if you look at non-parametrically and if you looked at our uh, preferred uh, logic specification. Uh, the nudge does increase distancing a little bit. It's actually a small amount. It's only 2%. And uh, the effect is not robust. For example, uh, you know, if we look non-parametrically, it's actually significant. But if we look uh, in terms of our preferred logic specification, it is not. It, you know, the significance of it is not uh, is not robust, and the effect is is uh, definitely smaller than uh, uh, than defined. Right. Um, and uh, if we also compare them uh, non-parametrically, the effectiveness of defined and the nudge, we find that marginally uh, defined is more effective uh, than the nudge. Um, this comparison is done at non parametric uh, level, so we don't have that many data points because we have to aggregate at the, at the group level. So the fact that there is uh, some significance you know, tells you that there's, there's, um, um, the defined is more effective than, than the nudge. Now, I've been talking about um, super spreaders, and I want to uh, make sure that, um, uh, that, that it's clear what I mean by uh, super spreaders. Now, first of all, uh, we know that for COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity among individuals in how contagious, uh, contagious they are. And a lot of the uh, epidemic is driven by 
uh, super spreaders, people that uh, infect many uh, more people than, than, uh, than, than most others, and, and definitely more than the, the median or the average. Um, now, uh, this is typically in a lot of viruses, and uh, a major determinant of being a super spreader is biological. Right? It can be physi physiological characteristics, genetic characteristics that are important. And uh, typically, uh, in most cases, an individual is completely unaware of these, uh, of being a super spreader because of these biological characteristics. Right? Now, the important dimension that I want to highlight and focus on of being a super spreader is the social dimension. Another thing that we know is that there's a, a very heterogeneous distribution of social interactions in society. Right? This has been documented in, in, in the social networks literature in, in a, a huge number of contexts. Some people have many more connections, many more interactions than others. Um, and one interesting thing about, uh, and obviously if you have many more interactions, you are, you know, you're going to be, uh, that's going to determine also, it's going to be one determinant for how much a super spreader uh, you are. And one key difference is that you are aware of this. Right. You know that if you are like a, a social hub in whatever context it is, you know about this. So the focus here, when I talk about super spreader, is really on this aspect of being a super spreader, which is one of the aspects that contributes to having a, a super spreader or not a super spreader. And uh, what we're going to compare is, uh, first of all, um, in a group where there is someone that is a super spreader and someone that uh, is more peripheral, uh, do participants practice more distancing when they are aware than they are the super spreader? Right? That's going to be we interpret comparisons in the star, the center, and the periphery. Uh, but also we can make a comparison between being the hub in the star, being the super spreader, uh, and being in the close knit position in the com in the complete network. That's the same number of interactions, but one is a heterogeneous society where the are the super spreader, and the other one is a close knit society where everybody has the same number of interactions. And what we see is that um, uh, social distancing decisions depend very much on uh, both the absolute number of interaction and the relative ones. If we compare the, and this is divided by treatment, so like baseline, all the baseline uh, data aggregated together, fine intervention and nudge intervention, there's no really big differences across uh, treatments. What we see is that when you are a super spreader, you are much more likely to distance and then we are a peripheral uh, individual. And also you are more likely to distance when you are a super spreader compared to uh, when you are, you had the same number of interactions, obviously this is a between subject comparison uh, and you are in a close knit uh, type of positions. Right? And these differences are large. Right? So uh, for example, if you are a super spreader, uh, you increase, you do, the probability that you do distances is 26% higher than if you are uh, a peripheral uh, individual. Um, if you are a super spreader uh, and uh, you are 10% more likely to uh, do distancing than if you are in, a, in the same number of interactions, but in a close knit uh, position, and, and similarly, if you are in a close knit position, you have a lot of interactions, you're more likely to distance than you are uh, if you are peripheral. And all these effects are quite large, both in our non parametric tests and in our um, uh, prefer logic specification. Now you may, uh, as, as you know, there's been a huge number of studies on COVID-19. One of the topics that is most um, studied in the US is the fact that there is uh, differences in distancing attitudes between the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, for example, these are two recent uh, working paper um, showing that um, there's less social distancing in areas when there are more Republicans using mobility data or from uh, smartphones. Right? So in our post-experimental questionnaire, we ask about political leanings and uh, we ask whether they are Republicans, they are self-identified as Republicans, Democrats, or other. That's a very clear identification in the US. Uh, so that's the advantage of asking it in, in that way. A slight disadvantage is that uh, it's a very coarse metric because you know, there's only three types of uh, classification. And the other category can include libertarians types on the far right, uh, but also you know, um, what you know, in the US we call socialist types on the, on the far left. Okay. Um, so there's a bit of a problem of um, putting these together. So we are going to look at the political leanings as 
they self-identify. But we also construct an ideology metric, metric from three questions that we have uh, that capture ideological, the answers are going to capture ideological leanings. Uh, these are Likert scale type of questions. And the key thing to remember is that we're going to build a metric just by summing up uh, essentially the answers to these three questions. It's going to be a zero to 12 metric. As the, you know, the key thing to remember is as the metric goes higher, you're going to be uh, more Republican leaning. Uh, so this is going to help us capture these, these two extremes. And we see a, a large um, difference when we just look at uh, you know, uh, aggregate level um, in terms of um, distancing in the uh, experiments, uh, whether you know, someone is Democrat or Republican. Right? So you can see Democrats in blue and Republican in red. And this is actually particularly high when it comes to the uh, fine treatment. Right? Um, so Republicans are less likely to practice distancing. If we actually look at our ideology, ideology metric, um, the effect is even um, more uh, striking. Uh, and there is kind of a gradual um, decrease in how much you do distancing as you are more uh, leaning towards um, being like a conservative. Okay. So obviously this is an association. And uh, you know, uh, if you are, uh, what it tells us is that if you are a Democrat, for example, you are 14% more likely to do distances than if you are a Republican. And we can you know, make a similar statement when it comes to the ideology index. Uh, but obviously this is just an association that we have. So what we are doing at the moment, and I was hoping to present you the preliminary results of this, but we're not there yet, uh, is to use an instrumental variable approach to see what this effect is causing. Okay. I won't get into this because, you know, anyway, I don't have results about this, but uh, it's about, uh, it's an approach used in a recent paper by Giuliano and Tabellini to investigate um, uh, ideological differences uh, in the US so we can sort of transport this approach to our setting um, to see uh, what is the causal effect of ideology on uh, distancing decisions. Um, now, very briefly, uh, if we look at um, distancing decisions and experiment, we compare them to the theoretical predictions. Uh, one clear effect that is kind of present almost throughout, if we look at uh, all the different uh, treatments, is that there's more distancing in the experiment than uh, there is uh, if everybody had self-interested preferences and played equilibrium. And one thing that we notice um, clearly is that we have a, a social preferences elicitation uh, in which we can classify participants as either being pro-social or individualistic. Uh, and it's very clear that this is an important determinant. Uh, it's, it's importantly associated with um, decisions to distance it. So if you are pro-social, and that's the orange bars, you're more likely to distance than if you are um, individualistic. Right? And uh, one question that we have in the survey is what is the reason to practice distancing? One choice is to protect others. Um, it's clear that this is uh, people that say that they do distancing to protect others are more likely to distance also in the, in the experiment. So, I'm going to show you briefly. Um, so we're using a larger model. So looking at the size of the effects is not straightforward. So I'm going to ask you to believe in the methodology, right? uh, which is we're going to look at the average partial effect that each variable is going to have on the distancing decisions. And I want to give you a view of um, what these different you know, uh, variables have an impact in decisions in the experiment. Obviously, for example, the blue bars here are going to be treatment dimensions. So here we can say something causal, right? The blue bars that you see, uh, this is the average partial effect of the treatment variable. And uh, this is going to be the 25th percentile. And this is, so the, the bottom end is the 25th percentile. This is the 75th percentile. Uh, and, the, and the line in the middle is going to be uh, the 50th uh, percentile. And what you can see is, is there is a, what we already uh, covered, a large effect of the fine twice as large as, as, the, as the nudge. Um, you know, the position, whether you are uh, a super spreader or you are well, you're super spreader or peripheral matters quite a bit. And if you're in a high contagion environment, you, you, the, the effect is, is larger. We've also seen the effect of ideology. So I'm not going to um, tell you much uh, more about this. 
Uh, but for example, something that uh, you know, we thought may matter is attitudes towards climate change or vaccines. And these don't matter at all. Right? We can look at social demographics and we find trends that are expected. Older individuals distance more, and that's over here, it's a large effect. Uh, females distance uh, more. Uh, there is a little bit uh, of an effect of whites uh, distancing less, but this is actually not robust and it's a weak effect. Right? Things like education and religion uh, don't really uh, matter. And um, our elicitation tasks tell us a story that is what we expect. They're kind, of, they kind of clearly picking up preferences that are important. If you are pro-social, you do more distancing. If you are seeking, you do less distancing. And this is, I think, Benson's questions at the beginning about the effect of stay-at-home orders. Right? Um, there is temporal and spatial variation on stay-at-home orders uh, in the US over this May month. Uh, and we coded all of them and looked whether they had an impact on distancing decisions, and it really doesn't. Uh, it's completely not associated with distancing decision. What I want to conclude is by just saying a couple of words about methodology, right? Uh, and what I want to say is that, uh, you know, when we think about experiments, uh, we have at least three different types of experiments, lab experiments, field experiments, and uh, uh, web-based experiments. And uh, as some of you know, I've been working on uh, web-based experiments for uh, almost 10 years, and uh, I'm a big fan of them. And I think that uh, one of the, uh, the things that uh, is, highlighted by um, this um, period is that, look, experimental method is something that um, we have been using, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an integral part of, uh, of economics. And in this period, the COVID-19, we cannot do lab experiments, so we cannot do field experiments for obvious reasons, right? So the only tool that is left in the experimental toolkit is web-based experiments. Uh, and it's an important tool because uh, obviously we know that experiments can give us clean causal uh, identification. Uh, it's a complementary to other tools. So for example, there's been a lot of studies in this COVID-19 time based on surveys. Right? And surveys are very useful. They can you know, be more large scales, uh, but we have to be careful because for example, self-reported perception of the efficacy of a policy is not the same as the actual behavior when you're interacting with others. And this is, uh, in the post-experimental survey, we ask people, uh, they have been, for example, exposed to the nudge treatment, so they don't know anything about the fine. And how effective is the fine going to be right, uh, in, in uh, social distancing? And we ask people, for example, in the, in the nudge treatment, how effective is going to be uh, um, a fine, uh, sorry, in the, in the fine treatment, how effective is going to be a nudge. Right? And what we see is a big difference in people's perception. They perceive the nudge to be much more effective than the fine. Right? Uh, but what it comes out in the experiment is that the fine was actually more effective than uh, the nudge. Right? Uh, so that's, it's important to get this uh, information about behavior. And when we think about the other big source of data when it comes to COVID-19 studies, that's mobility based uh, data. Um, you know, that has great advantages, uh, obviously, uh, but there's also, it's very large scale, it's about real behavior, um, but it's more challenging to do cause identification. It's more challenging to actually uh, exactly identify the effect of a counterfactual policy. This comes back to Sanji's original question, right? Uh, if you're in New York and you're doing fines, you know, as an enforcement policy, how do you know the effect of a, of a nudge? You can't rely on the data from uh, from Sweden. Right? Uh, and so I think that two methodologies can be quite complementary. And for example, uh, you can use mobility data to validate in terms of external validity, the results that we have. So for example, we find that uh, uh, Republicans engage in less social distancing. That's a similar finding that uh, um, you know, two recent working papers have looking at mobility data. Uh, so that can also reinforce the uh, the, the findings that we have in the, uh, in the experiment. And I know I'm running out of time, so this is just a summary and, and already run through the main, um, uh, the main results. Um, so thank you, and if there are any questions.